Well, we are starting a new series today. It's called The Power of God. And today's message is found on the back of your bulletin. It's called Jesus, The Power of God in Person. There are some blanks back there if you'd like to uh, fill in some words as we go along. That will be helpful to you. And uh, it will enable you then to remember where we were with the sermon. And then, too, there are some questions at the end that you can ask yourself or go over sometime this week also. I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Colossians today. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. And uh, if you're using one of our Bibles that's here and you're not exactly sure where that is, it's page 1832. Page 1832. And that will enable you then to follow along with the passage of Scripture that we're going to be looking at today. When Sherry and I visited the uh, Holy Land several years ago, we saw a lot of tremendous sites that were there. And one of those that we went to was called Caesarea Philippi. Now, that was especially interesting because of the topography of that place, but also because of the history of that place. I want to give you a bit about the topography first. It's this area where there's kind of a, a reddish-brown mountain, uh, and, and from that mountain, there's kind of like a cave on the bottom left side of that, and it used to be that the Jordan River's headwaters came from out of that cave. Then an earthquake occurred some time ago and changed that so that it comes out from another area there. But if you were to look at the water coming from there, it's, it's different than the picture you typically have of what the Jordan looks like. Uh, this water is fast moving. It is clear water. It's very green around there. There are trout that are swimming in the stream. It's cooler water than you would find a little further down past uh, the Sea of Galilee and on the way down to the Dead Sea. And, and in this particular mountain, if you were to look at it, you would notice that besides the cave on that lower left side, there are indentions which have been carved into the side of the mountain. And those indentions were carved there because in that particular spot, there were a lot of gods who were worshipped by the people. And especially the god Pan, P-A-N, you know who I'm talking about, uh, half goat and half man, and uh, play the flute, you know. Uh, Pan was worshipped there, but there were other gods that were too. And so they would put statues of those gods in those indentions in the side of the mountain there at Caesarea Philippi. Well, one day, Jesus and his disciples were there, and as they were there, uh, they were noticing all the activity that was going on down below them. And then Jesus turned to his disciples, and he said, who do people say that I am? Because all these gods are there. And, and so the disciples start answering. They say, well, some people say that you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead, because John had been beheaded sometime before this. There are others that say, well, you're Elijah, come back to life, or you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets that, uh, from, from the Hebrew scriptures that, that uh, existed a long time ago. You're reincarnated, so to speak. And then after hearing all these answers, then Jesus turned to them and said, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered him. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter uh, commended him for the answer that he gave and he said two things that I think are really interesting because they tie into the topography and the worship of that area. First of all, he said that uh, you are blessed for, for noticing this. He said, and on this rock, I will build my church. Now, the rock that he's referring to is the statement that Peter made. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What an appropriate statement that was to be near the big rock, the mountain where all these people worship so Jesus is saying it's not this rock that my truth is built on or my church is built on it's the rock of your statement that I am the Christ and then there's the other part of that he says and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it that cave that was there at that bottom left hand side of that was not only the area where was uh, the Jordan River's headwaters came from originally but there were also people who believed that was the gateway into the underworld. That's where you would go to actually get down into Hades. And so when Jesus is making his statement, he is saying, I'm building my church on the rock of who I am, and the gates of Hades, which people point out being in this area, are not going to prevail against my church. No other God is going to prevail against me. Nothing will prevail against my church. What a great statement that was. Now, it's important that we tie that in with today's message in Colossians because what we see here 
because there are a lot of people who are wondering about who Jesus is, and they come up with all kinds of answers. For example, Muslims will say that Jesus is a prophet, but they don't believe that he actually died on the cross. They don't believe he was actually the Savior. He's just a prophet who came from God. There are others who are philosophers who would call Jesus a great teacher, and there are others who, who really have nothing to do with church, but they might still have a favorable impression about who Jesus is. And, and there are a variety of other answers that we could talk about all day long if we so chose to do that. Jesus is the most discussed, most debated, most scrutinized person who has ever lived. Every year around this time, whether it's Easter or a few months ago at Christmas time, there are magazine companies that come up with this picture of Jesus on the cover of their magazine and they might ask a question like who was the historical Jesus or they might ask other questions about him and of course they interview a variety of different types of people and and still the answers that you get are kind of a hodgepodge of answers that never give you a clearly defined picture that matches up with what the Bible has to say but the idea is there's confusion on who Jesus is in the 1990s, there was a guy named Dewey Bertolini. And Dewey had this opportunity to go to a local high school. And when he was in that high school, he was speaking to these seniors who were going to be graduating before too long. And it's much like our seniors today who are getting close to graduation. And, and during the conversation he was having before the group, he brought up Jesus Christ. And he could tell there was confusion on that. And so he had the, the students divide up into discussion groups. He said, I'm going to give you 20 minutes to come up with an answer as to who Jesus really was. And so the students got together, and, and at the end of that 20 minutes, they, they each gave an answer. Each group talked about what they had discussed, and Dewey said it boiled down to each one of them saying essentially the same thing. Each one of them believed that Jesus was some religious dude who lived about 200 years before and in 1990-something, that would have been about the time of George Washington, he said. Isn't that amazing? That those students were seniors in high school getting ready to go to college and did not have a clear picture of the person, Jesus Christ. In our modern culture, as it becomes more secular and more anti-religious, there'll be even less understanding of who Jesus is and was. And that's why it's important for you and for me to determine from Scripture who he was, to understand what is written about him and to have a clear picture of what the Bible teaches us. And Paul gives us a great template. He gives us a great pattern right here in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. And the first thing we find here, and give you the blanks for your, your outline there, is his relationship to God. His relationship to God. It says in verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God. The image of the invisible God. Now that's an astounding statement. And, and part of what makes it astounding is that, that Paul uses a Greek word right here uh, in this description. It is the word icon. Anybody here ever hear the word icon before? It's, it's the word that oftentimes was used when computers were really getting popular. And those little things that you click on to get into Word or into the Internet or into Publisher or some other site, those are called icons. You click on Word and you are going to get into Word. You're not going to get into email by doing that. You will get into Word. And so when Paul is giving us this word icon here, he is saying if you want to get to God, if you want to know who God is, you click, so to speak, on Jesus. Jesus is the icon who will get you to God. But he's not just saying he will get you there. He's also saying he is God himself as well. He's not just God's ambassador. He's not just something you click on to get to God. He is God in person. He is the original. And he mentions that he is the invisible God. The last couple of weeks, I've, I've kind of felt... Uh, less than my best. I, I got this really bad sinus infection from raking leaves in my yard, and man, I'll tell you what, it knocked me out. And I'm on medication still. I'm able to shake hands today, which I'm glad for, but uh, for a couple weeks, I just kind of did the elbow thing or the uh, fist bump or just said, sorry, I'm not shaking today. But, but what happened is when I first started getting down, I had to lay down for a while. And I, I thought, you know, I'm going to listen to the Rays play baseball, but before the game came on, I wanted to watch a movie. And so I, I got a movie that we had at home, 
and I put it in the DVD player, and it was the movie National Treasure 1. Anybody here see National Treasure? Yeah, that's a, it's a cool movie. There's a lot of neat stuff in it, twists and turns. And, and one thing about it is, if, you, if I can give you kind of the main theme of this, is that this guy named Benjamin Gates believes that his family has been mistreated, so to speak, about their family history going all the way back to the Revolutionary War days. And he is setting out to kind of clear the family name. And he, he's, a, he's a guy who is a really brilliant mind. He has a couple other people with him who are also brilliant. And together, they determine that the back of, or somewhere on the Declaration of Independence, there is a message for them about this treasure. It's hidden somewhere. And so they steal the Declaration of Independence. And then they begin to try to look for clues on this. And they turn it over. And if you look at the back of the Declaration, it's just blank. But somehow or another, there was some water that got on the corner of that and some numbers appeared. They had been written in this disappearing ink, apparently. And so the water caused those numbers to appear and they determined that lemon juice would work even better. So they began to put lemon juice on the back of the Declaration of Independence and all these code numbers began to show up. Now that was good, but there was more to the picture. They found these glasses that had belonged to Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin had invented them. And they were like these lenses that you could kind of change, and they were different colors. And if you would look straight through them, you might see something, but then if you changed the lens, something else that was on the page would show up. And so they began to do that, and they saw there were different images that were printed on the back of the Declaration of Independence that no one could see until you had those special glasses those special glasses made the invisible visible and you know what we have an invisible God but Jesus Christ is able to make God visible he shows us who God is he has let us see who God is the naked eye cannot see God but Paul is saying here's here you go you want to know what God's like look to Jesus because Jesus made the invisible God visible and he uses another word for him here. It's the word manifest. He's making God manifest. To make something manifest, you make it seen or you make it experienced as well. Remember what Jesus said about himself one time? He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He is saying that connect me with God because I am God. Another time when he was talking to uh, the religious leaders of the time, he made a statement which has this really deep theological connection to it. He says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, he was using the same term for himself that came from a story from the Old Testament. Remember when Moses was out and he was taking care of sheep out in the wilderness? And while he was there, suddenly, just out of the blue, there's this, this plant, this bush that is caught on fire. It's not being burnt up, but it is burning. And, and out of this burning bush comes a voice and it calls Moses over to it and says take off your shoes because you are on holy ground and Moses takes his sandals off he gets closer and the voice coming from that is the voice of God and the voice of God is telling him I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go now Moses is nervous about this because he's a wanted man back there he's got posters around the post offices in Egypt saying here's a wanted man he killed an Egyptian and that was a long time ago. But still, he's concerned about the fact of going back. He doesn't think he can do it. He said, well, I, I can't do it. I've got, you know, uh, speaking problems. I don't speak clearly. I've got a speech impediment. He comes up with all kinds of excuses. And then he says something else. He says, well, who should I say sent me? And the voice says, I am who I am. I am who I am is sending you back. And that was God saying, I have always been, and I will always be. I am. And that word there also has a connection to it, to the word we translate Yahweh, which is a name for God, isn't it? And so, as this takes place in the Old Testament, now Jesus, fast forwarding a few thousand years, Jesus is talking to them, he says, even before Moses, and even before Abraham, I am. In other words, I am God. I am God. I'm the same as the one who was speaking from that burning bush all those years ago. 
And so when we understand that, we, we see that Jesus is declared to be God, but he has declared himself to be God as well. He has made the invisible God visible. And if you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. In verse 19, it says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Two things we need to understand about that. First of all, God's fullness is in Jesus. God didn't hold back some of his godliness when he was uh, sending Jesus to the earth to, to be our Savior. In fact, Jesus was fully God and fully man at the same time. Jesus also wasn't one of several beings who were sent from God. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. There were people in the time of the Colossian church who were teaching that because God was so holy, he would never come into contact with sinful man. So he would have to send someone, series of someones, to eventually get to the earth to, to be here on the earth with us, meaning that Jesus was the one who was eventually uh, sent to the earth. But all these other creatures or emanations from God were made before Jesus reached the earth. That's what they were teaching. They were saying that God was so holy, no way he could send himself to the earth. But Jesus, according to Paul right here, is, has the fullness of God in him. That's a neat thing, isn't it, to understand that. Paul says, no, not a lot of emanations, not a lot of people between God and Jesus. Jesus and God are the same, and Jesus has the fullness of of God in him and it says the fullness of God dwelt in Jesus to dwell means to be at home permanently so that's saying that Jesus was always God that Jesus was God while he was here and that Jesus will always be God for all eternity C.S. Lewis is a tremendous writer was a tremendous writer I I love the Chronicles of Narnia man I've read them several times and have enjoyed them but there's another book that he is extremely famous for it's called Mere Christianity and in Mere Christianity, he tells this thing, he says that about Jesus, because there were a lot of people who were saying, oh yeah, Jesus is a great teacher, but he really wasn't the Son of God. And this is, this is Lewis's answer to them. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept him, his claim to be God. Lewis goes on to say, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make the choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with this patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He was not, he has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, Lewis is not saying that Jesus wasn't a great human teacher. He certainly was. But he was, is also saying here that Jesus was truly God, the Son of Man and Son of God. There's a second thing here. That is his authority over creation. His authority over creation. Let's look at uh, verse 15 and then 16. The, the last part of 15 says the firstborn over all creation for by him all things were created things in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things were created by him and for him so the second thing that Paul says in this text is that Jesus is the creator of the world and first 15 says he's not only the image of the invisible God he's also the firstborn over all creation now, you may have had somebody come to your door uh, one day during the week, knocking on the door, having some kind of literature to give you and saying, we'd like to talk to you sometime about God. And, and if you were to talk to them, you would discover that they would have you turn to this passage of Scripture in Colossians chapter 1. And they would say that because of the wording here, this means that Jesus was a created being. They would tell you that God made Jesus, and then after that, then everything was made by Jesus or through Jesus. That's actually an ancient Arian teaching, which would indicate that, that Jesus was a creature and that Jesus was created by God in heaven and then sent here. But the leaders of the early church would refute that, and we can refute that as well, because that's not what the Bible teaches. Firstborn here doesn't mean that he was the oldest of siblings in heaven doesn't mean he was the oldest one in his family. Firstborn here is talking about prominence. It's talking about um, uh, first importance right here. So he's talking about 
uh, something which means that this, this person has authority, this person has leadership, this person is number one. And it's not saying number one born, number one, but number one. He is a leader here. He is of first importance. So first born here means over all creation. Before creation was made, he was there. And he is also over all creation. And what that ultimately means is that Jesus was not created, but Jesus created everything. There's a picture that Paul gives us right here in verse 16. He is the designer he is the designer. In fact, John, in describing him in his gospel, very first chapter says, all things were made by him. You know what that Greek word all means, really, in the Greek? It means all, okay? <laughs> that means everything, okay? He made everything. He means all, okay? And it means that, that whether on the earth or in space, whether visible or invisible, whether powerful or fragile, all things made by him, through him, his direct involvement for his glory is what's being talked about right here. Jesus is a lot like an architect and the builder of a building. He is the one who conceives what that's supposed to look like. He is the one who designs what it's supposed to look like. And he is the one who builds what it's supposed to look like. And he receives the recognition for it. And that's why we understand the truth about Jesus. We can understand why the winds and the waves would obey him because he was the designer of them. Why disease and death and demons would flee from him because they recognize his authority. He's the author and generator of life. He established the physical and scientific laws. DNA, gravity, seasonal changes, photosynthesis, chemical elements, physics, metabolism, movement, reproduction, and other biological processes, thermodynamics. He gave the brain its complexity, the eye its intricacies, the hand its dexterity, and the tongue its ability to speech to speak, excuse me. He gave the earth its ecosystem. He gave space its infinite vastness, and the sun its light and its warmth. And, and let me give you a couple of examples here of Jesus' designing ability. A male ruby throated hummingbird weighs slightly less or slightly more than a penny. Its heart beats 21 times a second. Its wings can beat 60 times a second. Twice a year, this tiny, gutsy little bird makes a 2,000-mile journey south, and then it makes a 2,000-journey mile north. How in the world does it do that? And, and how does it know where to go? It's because Jesus Christ has designed that little hummingbird. He is the designer behind that. In her book, Bi uh, Bi uh, Birdology, excuse me, naturalist Cy Montgomery describes the beauty and intricacy of an ordinary hummingbird. And at one point, uh, Montgomery quotes a woman who works with baby hummingbirds who says this. She says, you know that kind of awestruck feeling you get when you look at a great work of art? That sense of wonder, that sense of connection to something great and mysterious? It's the same feeling looking at a hummingbird. Or take this example uh, to, to think about. You have a hundred trillion cells in your body. Each one of them, science will tell you, is like a complex city, like the city of New York on a cellular level. Every second of every day, your cells are operating with millions of parts and interactions. A scientist uh, named Lewis Thomas, who was not a believer, once wrote these words about the beauty of a single human cell. He said, if I could explain what goes on in a human cell, I would for the rest of my life hire a plane and fly it back and forth across the earth just to proclaim the incredible wonder of how and why a cell works. Remember, all things were created by him, through him, and for him. Astronomer Dr. Peter Edwards explains the majesty of the universe with these words. He said, we pointed the Hubble telescope at what appeared to be a very ordinary patch of the night sky. And what the telescope saw was incredible. There were 10,000 galaxies in a patch of sky the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. If this tiny patch of sky is like every other, then we can calculate how many galaxies are out there. He says, the visible universe, meaning visible with this telescope, contains around 100 billion galaxies. Each one of these galaxies contains around 100 billion stars. And that means the visible universe contains something like 
10,000 million, million, million stars. That means that there are more stars in the visible universe than there are grains of sand on the earth. What an amazing thing. I love what Mark Batterson talks about in his uh, book called The Grave Robber. He says, you may feel as if you are sitting still right now, but it's an illusion of miraculous proportions. Planet Earth is spinning around its axis at a speed of 1,000 miles per hour, per hour. Every 24 hours, planet Earth pulls off a celestial 360. We're also hurtling through space at an average velocity of 67,108 miles per hour. That's not just faster than a speeding bullet. It's 87 times faster than the speed of sound. So even on a day when you feel like you didn't get much done, don't forget what you did. You traveled 1,599,793 miles through space. To top things off, the Milky Way is spinning like a galactic pinwheel at the dizzying rate of 483,000 miles per hour. He says, if that isn't miraculous, I don't know what is. Yet when was the last time you thanked God for keeping us in orbit? I'm guessing you've never prayed, Lord, I wasn't sure we'd make the full rotation today, but you did it again. We just don't pray that way. And that's the ultimate irony. He's also the sustainer, as it says in verse 17. He is the reason all things exist and hold together. As one New Testament scholar said one time, Jesus is the principle of cohesion. He's the glue that makes the universe a cosmos instead of a chaos. A Christian scientist named John Polkingholm used the following analogy. He says, imagine you're in the front of a universe-making machine. The machine has a master board with all kinds of knobs. One of these knobs controls gravity. Another knob controls electromagnetism, which is how things, including ourselves, are held together. Another knob can determine the speed of creation, how fast you create the universe. Another knob can determine the size of the cosmos or how big the universe will be. So in front of you are hundreds of knobs. You can turn and fine-tune the knobs to create life and existence as we know it. But then poking home continues on. He says, the only way to set the knobs and create life is to leave them exactly like they are now. He says, if you mess with even one knob, even just slightly, you will have made life impossible or you've made it impossible to sustain life. It will keep flying apart. Scientists call this phenomenon the anthropic principle, which basically means that the universe that we now have is so finely tuned to support life that miraculously, against all odds, all life coheres. It holds together. Now, you might think that's just all coincidence, all these things I've talked about, but I don't think so. I think they are indicators, I think they are signs of a master designer who is sustaining all of the universe, and it's talking about Jesus. Then thirdly, his lordship over the church is important as well. Verse 18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So, you know, if he's the head of the church, that's important for us to catch because that also means there's a body of the church. That means that you and I are the body. You and I uh, play the role of several different body parts. And we all have body parts within our bodies that function to help us to be healthy, that make us do the things we're supposed to do and, and uh, show that we are who we're supposed to be with the body. But the head is the one that directs all that. The head is the one who keeps it all together. The head is the one who sends out the signals. The head is the one who directs it all. And so when we look at Jesus, we see that he is the head. We see that he is the brain. He is the director. He is the leader of the church. As the head of the church, he supplies it with life and with direction and spirit. And that's important. Now, I want you to know that, that there is no pope who is the head of the church. There is no preacher who is the head of the church. In fact, you know, I'm not the head of this church. I want you to know that. Now, I am just like everybody else. I'm a sinner saved by grace who happens to be a member of this church, who happens to have the responsibility to preach and, and teach and lead, but at the same time, we all are in this together. Now, I'm not the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. I'm just a part of his body, just like you are. We are all a part of the body of Christ, and we are sinners saved by grace. So Paul calls Jesus the beginning and the originator, and we can call him the pioneer. 
Sherry and I went to uh, NASA back in November in Houston, Texas. And while we were there, man, we had a great time. What a, what a, a beautiful place that is. And it has all this space industry stuff, all these rockets and, and just all this stuff that's just so cool. And, and one exhibit in particular I thought was especially fascinating because it had the pictures of all the people who had been in space. Had the pictures of all the people who had gone up and had done some sort of rotation or whatever. But there was a special amount of attention given to two people. Those two people are Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin because they, in 1969, were the first two men to walk on the moon. What an amazing thing that was. That's a powerful thing. You know what? They were pioneers, weren't they? That's what you would really call a pioneer, somebody who's been there first, somebody who's gone ahead of everybody else. And that's what we find right here that Paul is saying that Jesus is. He's like the pioneer. He is not the first one who's ever been permanently, or he, is, he is the first one who's been permanently raised from the dead. He's not the first one who was ever raised from the dead. We know that Lazarus was. We know that a few others were raised from the dead. But they also died again, didn't they? But when Jesus died, we know that he did not die again that he has ascended to heaven. He is there and will be coming back someday. And the promise is, as the pioneer, as the first one, that people will follow him, and that will be you and me if we belong to Christ. The day will come when we too will follow the lead of the pioneer, and we will be resurrected permanently also. He says that in all things he might have the supremacy. And that's important for us to understand because... Uh, Paul is saying to all those people there in Colossae, listen, there are lots of gods, lots of statues, lots of people, uh, lots of uh, people who worship other gods and, and do so um, uh, every day. But we want you to know that Jesus Christ is not like all of those. He is supreme. He is God in the flesh. They are not. He is supreme. And then lastly, his reconciliation of all things. His reconciliation of all things. Let me read to you verses 20 through 22 it says and through him to reconcile to others or to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation he was the peacemaker. You know, several years ago, uh, there was this terrible situation that occurred. There was this Russian submarine. It's called the Kursk. It's spelled K-U-R-S-K. And the Kursk uh, had this, uh, this explosion that took place down below the surface, and, and it, it crippled uh, that submarine. And try as hard as they could, they could not rescue the people that were on board before they all passed away. Now, eventually, of course, that, that submarine was brought to the surface and they were able to examine things and they found the bodies, of course. And, and, and on one of those bodies, a guy had written a note and he stuck it in his pocket and they pulled this note out. And this is what the note said. It said, there are 23 people here. None of us can escape. Now, everyone was saddened, of course, by that note and could feel some pain for the desperate author and his loved ones as well. But the truth is that that note was describing uh, an impossible situation. And it's like the same kind of situation for people who are outside of a relationship with God. There's, there's, there, it's like they've been separated uh, and crippled, so to speak, by sin. And there has to be a rescue to take place. And, and we are not impossible to rescue. We can be rescued. And we when we give our life to Christ, we are being rescued. So Jesus has come to, to bring peace between us and God. He's come to rescue us. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, we find that, that when Adam and Eve sinned and Satan had caused that through the serpent, we know that, that God gave a promise, several promises. And one of those promises was that he was going to send somebody who would crush the head of the serpent, even though the serpent uh, would, would bite him on the heel. He was talking about sending Jesus. Because what happened is, instead of man running to God when he sinned, he hid from God. There was a separation that took place. And people have always been hiding their sin from God. People have always been staying away from, from God if they have sin in their lives. 
but this is saying that Jesus is there to make peace. He's there to make a way. He's there to take away that separation and to give us a connection with God. And so he did that by making peace through the blood of his cross, as it says in verse 20. He didn't do it just through his life, even though that was significant and important, but he did it through his death on the cross. He did that as a payment maker. It was through him and through his blood that that happened. N.T. Wright wrote, The death of an obscure Jew, meaning Jesus, on a seemingly God-forsaken hill in a backwater of the Roman Empire attracted no notice from the historians of the era, but it was the event that reconciles heaven and earth and us to God. You know, I, I think that there are really two responses that a person could make about Jesus. They could determine that, yes, this is really true, that he really is the Christ, and I need to give my life to him. Or they might say, you know what, I, I need to know more. Maybe you're here seeking, and you say, you know, I, I just want to know more about Jesus. But I'm hoping that today was a really good head start for you if you're seeking and have not accepted him yet. But if you say, I'm ready, say, I want to give my life to Christ, I want to surrender my life to him, then today would be a wonderful day to do that. I'm going to be back in the back of the room as we do our invitation. Ray is going to come up. Both Rays are going to come up and, and lead us in this song. I'll be back there if you would like to talk about making Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior, and especially after hearing today's message, then I hope that you'll meet me back there, and I'll be happy to, to get together with you. All right, let's stand together. I'll meet you back in the back.